Hello and welcome. I'm Bonnie Lynn, a PhD candidate in practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. And I'm really excited to moderate our panel discussion on field work and pastoral practice. Our seven distinguished panelists are Jerry Park, Jane Hong, Melissa Borja, Easton Law, Jillian Chu, Geoman George, and Jonathan Tran. And they have a very wide range of expertise. They are sociologists, historians, theologians. Um, they use oral history, ethnography, and other qualitative and quantitative research methods to help them better understand the communities, cultures, racialized experiences, and religious lives of Asians and Asian Americans. So as we begin our conversation, uh, I just want to point out that those of us who have experience in both field work and ministry know that Field work and ministry both rely on particular skill sets and postures. They both involve observing and learning from community life, asking fruitful questions, listening with care, interpreting social contexts and cultural norms, practicing accountability, and discovering where God is at work in the messiness and contradictions of life. And so as we're having the discussion, I just encourage um, those who are listening in to please think of questions that you want to ask our panelists about their work, about how field work relates to pastoral practice. You can go to the Q&A tab on the right hand and you can type your question there and also upvote questions there as well. So just to begin, I want to ask panelists, uh, can you begin by sharing a little, in what ways do you see your field work as a form of ministry? I'm happy to uh, address this question and, and go, go first. I would say, and I, and I should mention first and foremost that I begin as a researcher, but I also do a lot of work in church contexts as a religious educator, Sunday school teacher for many years. I work with kindergartners, so a little different audience than um, maybe college students, which I'm used to teaching. But I, I would say there are four basic principles that I think ministry and research have in common. Um, and I'm speaking, I should mention, as an oral historian. So I think I've discovered the importance of trust and prioritizing trust in um, oral history work and in ministry. You can't have a meaningful conversation until there is a relationship of mutual trust. And you also can't see people change their minds or their hearts unless there's a context of trust. The second thing I think that I see is connected as is um, the importance of honoring a conversation as being sacred. Uh, there are so many times when we talk, this world is so loud. I admit as an extreme extrovert, I contribute to a lot of noise pollution in this world. So I think it makes the opportunity to have quiet time to genuinely listen to hear another person's story, to take the time to do that work, to have a conversation, that's very sacred. And so conversation, whether it's in a classroom or in a church space, is sacred. And it's important for us to respect the sacredness of that um, experience. Third, I, I think it's important for us to approach conversations with deep humility uh, and the understanding of other people's needs, priorities, definitions, worldviews is really, really important. I think we need to, as people who work in ministry, but also work in, as researchers, uh, we need to resist the temptation to impose our own priorities, definitions, worldviews on other people without first understanding their needs, priorities, definitions, and worldviews. And I guess my fourth point is a little bit more complicated, but I guess maybe thinking about conversation as being like reading a novel, except instead of reading a novel from the beginning to the end, every time you engage in a conversation with someone, whether it's a conversation at church or a conversation for research, you're beginning the novel, but at chapter eight, 
And you don't really know what happened in the first seven chapters of the book. Um, so that reminds you to be really humble. We don't know what happened before the conversation. Maybe you know a little bit, but you don't know all of it. Um, but you also know that the experience of having a deep encounter with another person, a conversation with a lot of deep listening, sharing space, sacred space in conversation with another person can be transformative, both for that person and for you. And so here's where I think there's real power and agency in a conversation. So if we think about a conversation as beginning a chap, uh, reading a novel in chapter eight, we don't know what happened before, but I think through the conversation, both of you, the scholar or and the narrator, the person whose story you're listening to, can rethink what happened before and what will happen in the future, what preceded the interaction and what will follow. So here is um, where we can think about engaging in conversation as an opportunity for power and agency. And that, of course, requires us to proceed with increased wisdom and, and compassion. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. What do others think about this? How do you see your field work as a form of ministry? Or feel free to respond to also what Melissa shared. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, my voice is scratchy again. It, it's it's not that early this morning, but I still have a scratchy voice. Um, I think I resonate with a number of things that Melissa shared both yesterday and then in what she shared just now, kind of thinking about, I also do oral history interviews. And if I think about field work more broadly, even just kind of engagement, scholars engagement with church communities and ministry communities, like I think <clears throat> listening to people in non-judgment, letting folks tell their own stories and shape their own testimonies. Um, and I think one thing I've I've really just been blessed by is this, well, first of all, I think of ministry as, as mutual, right? So it's not necessarily me ministering to other folks. I've actually just been surprised by how much other folks have ministered to me through the process of these interviews and also just through conversations I've had. Conversations, including conversations like this at this conference. And I think one thing that I've really appreciated and kind of has been very encouraging to me is just the practice that I've been able to develop in, in translating kind of scholarly conversations about a lot of the topics that we you know talk about. Scholarly conversations um, to, to kind of church audiences and broader general audiences. And I think this is one way that scholars, and I think many of us here, we want to speak to the church and edify the church in whatever way we can, because we have these many, many, many years of, of professional training and many, many years of writing these books in like solitude. And, you know, I think my heart and I think the heart of many folks here is, is to just be able to somehow bring that to bear upon um, other folks of faith, especially those, you know, it's a hard time. And, you know, I think there are many challenges facing the body of Christ in general. And so however scholars can speak to those challenges and kind of bring clarity, help, encourage. I mean, I think that's what something that I think we all want to do. I mean, just I'll give one example. I mean, in terms of my current project, I'm writing about the history of Asian American evangelicals, and I'm looking at it in terms of both both post-65 Asian immigration and the rise of the religious right. And, you know, this project actually grew directly out of my involvement in ministry settings. This, act, this project grew out of um, something called the Venn diagram, which I think um, many of you are familiar with. Um, it's an intervarsity graduate faculty ministry project here in Southern California, where we have scholars um, kind of talk about different topics to Christians, Asian American Christians, so it's specifically targeted. And I gave a talk in January, 2017, right before the inauguration of Donald Trump, I gave a talk on the rise of the religious right um, and just the ways in which conservative evangelical Christianity had become institutionalized as a constituency within the Republican Party. And this is a well-known topic. I mean, there are many, many US historians who write about this topic. It's like its own cottage industry of George Marsden students and others. Um, and what I realized is that folks didn't, like most Christians had no idea what I was talking about. And yet, and so that kind of disconnect uh, really struck me because you know, a lot of the conversations even that we're having today, like the agenda, right? Conversations like the rejection of critical race theory, um, questions about patriarchy, I think of like um, Kristen Dumais, Jesus and John Wayne, the recent kind of um, debacle with uh, Beth Moore and the SBC, like a lot of those conversations that we're all embedded in and that we 
engage with in different ways. Like those conversations are set by um, kind of white evangelicals. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked about this throughout this conference. And, you know, I think a lot of times we don't, Asian Americans, Christians in particular, don't really know like, I don't think we know the history that's created the waters that we swim in. And that, and so the history of the religious right, the moral majority, Jerry Falwell, and the ways in which, you know, evangelicalism became a political strategy used by the Republican Party, both with the, you know, with the kind of um, participation of evangelical Christian leaders, as well as Republican Party strategists like this. I teach this every year in my U.S. history survey. There's a whole class called the rise of the religious right. Um, and it's just a topic <laughs> that U.S. historians talk about regularly. And so thinking about the ways in which scholars can help bridge those gaps um, and perhaps bless the church and kind of help us to kind of understand where we sit. Like, I feel like that's a ministry that I've been very, that I'm very invested in and that I'm hoping my kind of research, my field work, and then also my second book will help contribute to that conversation. But in the process, as I mentioned, um, I've been blessed by so many folks I've talked with. I've had folks pray for me. I was pregnant, then I gave birth, then I had like my first year as a mom during the pandemic. And I've had so many of my oral history interviewees <laughs> pray for me and bless me and encourage me. And so I think this is a deeply, this is a deeply personal, right? Um, kind of deeply personal project as well as a scholarly project in which I'm able to use my training to bless not only, you know, hopefully to bless the church, um, but also to speak to just kind of a wider community as well. You know, jumping off of that, I, I um, have found surprisingly, I, I walk into uh, interview sessions uh, when, when we're doing uh, quantitative research and sometimes qualitative research, we try to mix methods together and such. Uh, what I find uh, surprisingly over and over again for me is um, I walk in there thinking uh, with my sociology hat. I think uh, of myself as a sort of a neutral, objective uh, researcher. <clears throat> We're asking questions that I don't expect to elicit any strong emotional reactions. But over and over again, I find <clears throat> people have quite a lot to say. Uh, and it brings them into stories that I, apparently in some situations they told me I was the first person they told this to. And so I feel like uh, one of the things I've learned, um, uh, if we can call it ministry, is, is to say that when people uh, disclose this kind of information to me, uh, their stories, I've become a steward of it. And I've got to be, I'm, I need to take that uh, responsibility very seriously when it comes to what is this going to look like in a book? What is it going to look like in an article? Uh, what, what, what will the implications be? Uh, I had one pastor even tell me, uh, he's African American, and uh, it's a predominantly black church. And I was saying we were really having a hard time trying to uh, get cooperation from uh, black churches in, in which we can interview folks. And he said, <clears throat> "You know what? Uh, one of the things he said this off the record. One of the reasons why I think you're getting a lot of pushback or or just non-response is because uh, a lot of uh, Christians are worried that you're going to make them look bad. So why why should I, you know, agree to do any kind of interview with you?" Uh, so even even though I pointed out that I'm a Christian and you know I, I was uh, attending their services and, and such, it it it's not it's not enough. So uh, those are some of the things I picked up. Yes, thank you. And you know one thing I've heard again and again, is that oral history and ethnography um, involve very disciplined ways of listening to better understand social behavior, um, cultural dynamics, and how might these disciplined ways of listening also help pastors and other Christian leaders to understand their churches and organizations better? I'll chime in. I on, am a uh... Go ahead, Easton. Okay, thank you. Um, um, and I hope my connection is, is good. Um, what I found with uh, ethnography as a pastoral practice, first, um, I had the privilege of taking a course with Mary Clark Michella at Wesley Theological Seminary called Ethnography as Pastoral Practice. And the fact that they're teaching this, they were teach, she teaches this course now at Yale Divinity School says that this is not just an academic endeavor. She is training MDivs about the use of ethnography for congregations. 
And I think one of the big things that w really uh, struck a chord with me is in a lot of pastoral training, you're trained to listen, but you're trained to listen to individuals or families as units and to parse out you know, the, you know, what God is doing, what the trauma may have been, these types of thinking in those types of units. But what ethnography will do is it trains you to think about your congregation as a whole cultural unit. It will train you to think about the history of the church as a culture that has developed with its own wounds and triumphs. And it allows you to think church as, uh, as, as an ecosystem unto itself and how individual groups and members um, are situated in that. Every pastor knows there are often political issues with long-standing families or newcomers or changes in the church. Stories, um, the same way that uh, Melissa was talking about in terms of uh, reading, reading a book, uh, you know, about a, a church and not just a person. For me, field work is theological work. Oh, I, I am a scholar. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. For me, field work is theological work. I am a scholar. I am also a pastor. I started a church plant about 15 years ago among South Indian Americans. And the, and the ethnographic approach has really helped me to be more intentional to be present with my congregations. It helped me to understand and place them in the context. Location is key. And also the process of translation was also very much uh, easily done because I was able to listen to them. Remember within the congregation, there are different groups. There are the older generation, there is there are the singles, there's the married, there are the, there are the young people. So. As a pastor, you need to make sure that uh, you are listening to all these groups, all these people, and they are not objects of your study. It's very important. They are subjects to be walk alongside with, to listen to, and it is a process. Right? It is not, uh, you know, uh, just go and do and that's it. It is. It is a process of being together, eating together, you know, and listening as we are eating and praying together. So these practices uh, will help us, at least has helped me as a pastor, uh, to bring in both the ethnographic uh, emphasis on listening and observing into my pastoral work, and also self-reflexivity, understanding all my biases as a pastor, as a male, you know, uh, my own privileges. It's important to recognize that as well in my ministry. Yeah, yeah I echo what um, Dr. George just mentioned. Um, and so, so sorry for cutting you off. I, um, and and I, I also find it important um, in doing ethnography to reflect on my positionality as a woman and as an insider researcher and how I'm being perceived. And I've had um, experience of um, my participants explaining to me like um, slangs and it's um, so like, do you know what that means? And I'm just kind of like, I grew up here, dude. I, I definitely speak Cantonese. Like, what are you talking about? And so like, and, and to continuously reflect on who I am as a researcher and how that affects the interactions with my participants. And, um, um, and as we have oral historians here, I also use qualitative secondary data um, from two oral history databases. Um, and, and watching the videos of the interactions, I realized how important it is for the ethnographer to be, for the interviewer to be in conversation and who the interviewer is and how they interact, how they ask the questions and how they position themselves. And, and how they're being perceived by the participants makes so much difference to the conversation and to what's being um, said and what, and 
um, as Dr. Park said, um, how some stories were told the first time. And because of that kind of, as um, Dr. Borja said, just the kind of trust um, that's being um, in this conversation. And so um, I find it very important to continuously reflect on who I am and how um, I would see certain things. And so maybe they said certain things in a, with the intention of being perceived one way, but because of who I am and my background, I've perceived it a different way and reacted differently from how they expected me to. And that in turn changes the conversation. And I think that kind of reflexivity on who, who you are, who I am, and it's, it's important also in a pastoral practice because um, as as I was doing my my um, master of divinity at Regent College, I realized a lot of my um, fellow classmates were very introverted as I am. Um, so um, and that gives a lot of space for us to think of who we are um, and who to reflect who we are. And so, how would that look like in community? The reflection of self in community. I think that's an important gift. Yeah, thank you so much. You raised this important point about how there are power dynamics involved between the, the researcher and the informant and between pastors and congregation members, you know, leaders and laypersons. And, and so, um, and you mentioned there, there are things you can do to ask questions in a certain way that and listen in a certain way that invites disclosure and encourages that and builds that trust and connection. Um, and so this is a question to any of our panelists. What are some ways that you found um, can build that kind of camaraderie and trust um, in order to sort of break through some of that power dynamic while never losing sight of it? However, yeah, please. Okay. I, I will just say it is common practice in oral history not to do an interview the first time you meet somebody, that you have pre-interview meetings so that you answer all their questions, you share who you are. This is partly practical because you know you gotta make sure they know what they're getting into, and this is part of the ethics of being a responsible researcher. But a lot of it is to establish a connection. And so I think this is really important to build trust in getting the person who is going to participate in the research project to trust you as the researcher. But I also have to lift up something that Jillian brought up. I think for women who are doing research that involves going to spaces that might not be safe, it is an opportunity for us to figure out contexts of danger and safety as well. And so I, um, I think almost every woman I know who's been doing research that involves conversations with people that might be private, there's often consideration of, well, is it gonna be safe for me to be in this place? I, I have had, I've been sexually harassed when I've done interviews. I've often gone with someone just to make sure I'm okay. And so I, I think the gender positionality issue is really important and safety is a consideration for lots of different reasons. I was going to note uh, very quickly that for me, um, and this might be a little bit different because of how I identify as a, as a practical theologian. Um, when I approached a lot of my informants and began conversations, again, I agree with Dr. Borja, you start with building that rapport, so it's very, very important. Um, but part of that rapport was my identification as a practical theologian, which would be different from historians, different from sociologists, with other Christians. And then so there's this other, there's this, there was this connection between knowing that this isn't just about you and this isn't just about me. And this was kind of the, 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 the tone I wanted to set in the rapport building. This is about trying to understand what God is doing. You know, in China, as well as for me as a, China, as a, as a researcher from the United States, so that people in the United States can understand the Chinese Christian experience better. And I guess this is a roundabout way of answering, uh, Bonnie, your first question. How do I see my particular set of research as a ministry? I think American Christians, Asian American and otherwise, would benefit from knowing how Chinese Christians 
experienced their faith um, and, and, and seeing places of connection and growth and, and building sort of these uh, connections across, um, across, you know, cultures and nationalities. Yeah, thanks for that. So there are really particular postures and skills involved in field work. And, you know, we're talking earlier about how um, getting into the nitty gritty, messy details of everyday life um, can help us discern, you know, how God is at work, what God might be doing, where God might be challenging um, the current structures, systems, and practices in place. And so can you say something about that in your own field work? You know, how have you sort of discerned God's activity um, as you're involved in hearing stories and you know, observing communities? I found that um, at every turn, one could find that. Um, the, st the struggle I had in making the turn from a person that mo works mostly in kind of theory and in the rhetoric of argument to the ethnographic material, the, the, the struggles were two. One, being accountable to the empirical evidence. Um, you know, it wasn't just arguments that I was marshalling, I was answering to people's stories. The second though, that was equally challenging was learning how to write in a way sufficient to telling the stories. The stories are beautiful, right? They're, you find yourself, uh, Melissa, I thought had a really great way of putting it. You find yourself in the middle of chapter eight. You find your, yourself in the middle of human dramas that have long histories uh, and that they're gonna go on. And if you're appropriately situated, you start cheering for certain outcomes. Uh, you get involved in the drama of human life. How do you convey that on a page? Right. That's not the same as writing an argument. It's not the same as kind of it's 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 a work of answering evidence, but it's something more. And so there I I, I realized my writing just wasn't up for the task of telling the story of these these beautiful people. Um, and I had to learn to write again. Uh, I don't think I got very far in that, but at least I realized to tell the story of these people, which, you know, I think, as Dr. George said earlier, um, is you know to tell the story of God. How do you how do you write adequate to that? Uh, and that was a really um, humbling, right? Like you, would, I would spend days on a few sentences, kind of thing, um, because I wanted the I wanted the book to be as much of a page turner as these people's lives were. Um, I felt to honor them would be to tell their story in a way that's not boring, overly wordy, cumbersome, right? You, we we academics, of course, always worry about that, but it's different when it's hinged to a person. Like you don't wanna make a really exciting person's life boring because you're a bad writer, right? That's something I constantly struggled with. So uh, th that was one of the harder things, but I think rewarding as well. Does anybody else wanna jump in on that question? I think I have a version of an answer. So it's a, it's, it's a different take from um, what Jonathan just shared. But I mean, thinking about how this field work has allowed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I just, did I just lose all of you for a moment? Sorry. Um, am I back? OK, awesome. I came to campus just for that, just to make sure my, my connection was OK. But um, I think. Oops, I see that. Um... <laughs> Dr. Hong has lost connection in the middle of that thought. <laughs> oh, Hopefully okay. Hopefully will regain connection. Am I back? Okay, my apologies. I'll say, I'll, I'll make this uh, quicker then. I mean, I think as a Christian, my lifelong Christian, I thought I understood a lot of what was going on within the church. <laughs> I thought I kind of knew, I don't know, I had I have uncles who are pastors. I grew up in like the same church as my a lot of my family members. I saw my uncles like go through a lot as pastors and church leaders. And I've seen a lot of like within the Korean immigrant church in particular, but like, you know, taking on this book project, I've, I've really been exposed to like the pain that really exists. Um, within the church around um, like women, right? Women in the church and their particular pains, um, 
kind of generational struggles that are still ongoing, right? This isn't just a 1996 silent exodus story, but that this story, right, very much continues in the present. And so just kind of seeing the pain and the struggles and kind of understanding better also, or kind of hearing from church leaders and their challenges and what they kind of have to work through with each different, like, you know, with pastors, like what they are able to say, what they're not able to say, the different pressures that they're juggling. So, I mean, I don't claim at all to understand truly, like and completely the challenges that pr practitioners face, that people in ministry face, that many of you here face. But I think just talking to people, I've just, <laughs> I've, 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 because I've heard folks' struggles and their, and their pain and their kind of their stories, I think, I guess it allows me to see God's redemptive hand in different ways. And I think that is through the testimonies of, of folks that I've talked to. And I've talked to lay people as well as leaders, right? So I'm not just talking to like the president of this or the president of this. I'm talking to like lay people, folks who were involved in different ministries over the years. And, you know, I think, yeah, I, I think, so that, that's another way I think that this research has become an unexpected kind of minist like ministering to me as, as well, hopefully as, as ministering to others, but, just being able to see like how folks kind of wrestle with the humanity and the brokenness of our institutions, right? But are still able to cling on to God and to understand kind of the relationship between, right? A, a perfect, infallible Lord and just the, in, the, the kind of fallibility of human institutions. So I think that's been something I've been really struck by through this process. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope I'm not putting you on, on a spot, uh, Dr. Jerry Park. Um, I know you're a sociologist and you work a lot with quantitative data. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit um, to that too. Like in what ways have, you know, do you find the type of research and field work that you do um, has a form of ministry where you might discern God at work? Yeah, uh, I mean, what I see in a lot of quantitative research is uh, you've got great breadth of coverage, right? We, we know um, like how many people, for example, attend church every week uh, from certain kind of backgrounds, but we don't know what going to church means to people. And so uh, I think the best kind of social science research is actually mixed method. And mixed method for me, at least, would entail interviewing and if possible, uh, the incredible work of ethnography. Uh, one of the things I'm hoping to do with this project, if it gets funded, is uh, not only would we have a map of all these congregations, but if we can also recruit a whole new generation of scholars to actually visit specific churches within the database so that we're not just sort of saying, well, out of convenience, I'm here in Texas, so I went to two churches in Dallas. You can say, wait, hold on. I actually need grant money to take me to Los Angeles and to Dallas because they're, they're both uh, of the same kind of profile and we need to listen to their stories. We need to uh, find out what this particular characteristic about church life means in both of these two contexts, in these two congregations. So I see uh, qualitative research having a, a, a great connection with the quantitative research. And uh, as I said before, as, as far as ministry is concerned, one of the things uh, I, I see so powerfully in the few interviews I've done is uh, how responsible I've become to uh, telling and, and uh, storing someone's stories. Yeah, thank you so much. I see uh, some questions in the Q&A, and this one is from Jonathan Tao, and he says, how can lay people help initiate grassroots efforts on conversations about race and justice without waiting for pastors or academics to bring it up? So to prevent these conversations uh, from being reserved to certain people with academic or pastoral authority. In, in the Indian American context, most of the conversations are not from the pulpit, but from the congregations, and particularly from the young people. As I shared in my paper, Frida, who is a Sunday school teacher, so paying attention to the group chat, recognized that there is a pattern emerging, different conversations, fears, anxiety, questions, questions about faith, faith and culture. And then she initi initiated a conversation with the students. And then she realized that this needs to be a larger conversation 
not just with the, the, the small group of students in that, in that Sunday school. So then she became an advocate for them, bringing different people in leadership. And as a result, what happened was a series of conversations taking place, having those intergenerational conversations and difficult conversations about racism within the church, and also ways to advocate and stand in solidarity with, with others at this time. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, one thought that I had was is that field work can be very pastoral and it can also be very prophetic. Um, the stories that arise can help Christian communities to see themselves differently in a new light, um, can help to subvert the status quo and change things up and help communities pursue positive change. And I'm just wondering um, to our panelists here, where have you seen that happen in your own field work? And how do you, you know, after hearing these stories, um, after thinking about them, also give them back to the community as a mirror of sorts? You know, how does that process work? Because it's not just, oh, I'm taking information from them and then it's just for me and I'm doing whatever I want, but you're also accountable to the community too. And, and so can you just speak more to that process, what that's like, what that involves and what that has resulted in your own work? Very quickly, I'll, I'll chime in here with a, a theological um, method that uh, I, I've, I've done some work in and haven't been able to practice yet, but my goal is to use it in the next phase of my research, is, and it's called theological action research, which comes out of um, the UK um, from a couple of people, Claire Watkins and, and Helen Cameron. Um, and theological action research is about not only drawing a lived theology out, but then going back to the congregation with your theological findings, if you will, and continue in conversation about uh, trying to discern what God is doing for the congregation or for whatever group you're working on. And to just be very concrete about my intentions, I've done this work with mainland Chinese Christians, um, and I've come to some conclusions about what uh, spiritual formation looks like in that setting. So I do want to go back and offer up these sort of theological reflections be like, is this true of, of, of your spiritual journey? If not, how can we correct it? And then together, can we work out what is God is doing, what is God doing in, in our lives? Um, and, uh, and so it really is a practice of coming back to the congregation, working with the congregation, discern together. It's not just the theologian or not just the ethnographer or the historian. Um, I mean, Obviously, there's precedence for this method in action research writ large. I don't know if action research works in history or uh, uh, sociology the same way. Sociology, maybe, but uh, it's it's definitely a method that's worth taking a look at. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anyone want to speak about I don't know a specific example where you know you've seen this happen? This dialogical process of bringing something back to community and maybe their response has helped you to look at your own research a little differently or to modify it in some way so that it's more faithful. I actually wrote an article on oral history practice and how um, the responses from the community shaped how I understood the whole project. You know, so it was very dialogic. Uh, and I'll try to find the link and put it in, in the chat. But I think in order to do research well in general, you have to have a posture of humility and you need to open yourself up to being surprised and being wrong, <laughs> to be completely wrong. And I think this has been discussed in very different contexts. Uh, so I also feel like um, it, it the conversations can really be mutually informative. And so I, I think there can be really surprising results from having uh, sort of long, thoughtful conversations that might begin in the context of research, but might have um, impact beyond the academy. So. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry. I can offer just a brief a brief note on that. I mean, I think, so my book is still in process and this is um, 
my second book, which is a great departure from my first book in many ways. But I've really taken a lot of, so I've really been inspired and encouraged by other historians. So academic, professionally trained historians who are also Christian, who have basically, you know, their books have really been ministering um, to Christian to Christians in America and maybe across the world as well. Um, and I, I, I'll just drop a few links in the chat. Jamar Tisby is one. I know that there are many churches across the country that are reading The Color of Compromise, which is his first book, where, I mean, he's he's a PhD student, so he's professionally trained, and um, he writes about the churches, the white church's complicity in anti-Black racism and talking about the histories of slavery and thinking about U.S. history, um, yeah, in, in this light, and, and, and as Christians. And so in that book, he speaks directly to Christian audiences. And he's specifically, I think, speaking to evangelical Christian audiences, primarily white is my guess. Um, but I know the book has been a blessing and encouragement to a lot of different folks, including Asian American folks that I've talked to, like college friends of mine who never really thought much about race have been reading this book um, in small groups at church and have been really blessed. Mm -hmm. And the other is, um, you know, the, the book I mentioned earlier by Kristen Dumay, who's a professor at Calvin University, um, which is an evangelical Christian school in Michigan. Um, Jesus and John Wayne, she writes about, yes, there it is, yes, yes. <laughs> white Christian patriarchy, and, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, there's been a lot of interviews, she's done a lot of interviews, a lot of press, um, and I'm not completely done with it, I'm about three quarters of the way through, but I've been struck by just the ways in which, like, there are many intersections even with my life, right, even though I'm an Asian American Christian who grew up in a Korean immigrant church in New Jersey, um, it's actually surprising just the different moments where I can see the story she tells kind of touching my life um, growing up um, in, in New Jersey in a, in a Korean immigrant church. So I feel like those two books have been kind of models for me in some ways of how professionally trained historians who are Christians can speak to scholarly audiences, but also bless the church like in really concrete ways. So I, I'm striving kind of toward that model, but. We'll see in a few years, we'll see. <laughs> We're rooting for you, thank you. <laughs> so here's a question from Brooke Johnson at Princeton University, and she asks, what self-care practices have been instrumental for each of you uh, in doing this sacred field work in pastoral practice? I mentioned in the chat already that I often find the work of caring for people and listening to people and being present for people really emotionally demanding that I liken myself to, I mean, this is maybe a little bit self-aggrandizing, but you know, like baby Yoda and the Mandalorian when he uses the love force and then, and then, and then he falls over because he's so exhausted from exerting that amount of care. Uh, I feel the same way about all of the things we're discussing, um, researching, of course, serving my faith community, serving my non-faith community as well. But we haven't really talked that much about uh, teaching and mentoring, but that's another part of what a lot of us do. And that is a big part of, I think, my impact on the world or what I hope to have an impact. Uh, I mean, I really want to shape the other people around me, especially the people I'm, I'm teaching and, and the young people I'm trying to offer a, a model of, of responsible, ethical, socially engaged scholarship for. Um, so it's exhausting. And so one thing that I have found really useful is before I go into having a conversation with a student, with someone who's sharing their story with me, with a member of my faith community, I take time just to rest and to remember why I'm doing it, to center myself on my mission. And then I take time to rest immediately after. I literally schedule it in 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after to take time to rest for those conversations that I know will demand a lot of emotional energy. Um, I think one thing that is hard is we have a Zoom organized life right now where every minute is almost scheduled. And I think maybe we could all help each other be accountable for the need for rest by saying, we're gonna have this meeting from one until 145 or 150, and then we're gonna schedule that in and say, I'm going to make sure we have 10 minutes to just breathe before we begin again. So I think we could all help each other make time for rest before and after these 
exhausting things. And, and daily life is, is exhausting right now. I'll add one more thing. I, I lead a young team of researchers. I have 15 researchers on my research team. We research really traumatic stuff. They are reading stories of people experiencing violence, members of their own community experiencing violence every day. Secondary trauma is real. Every single one of my research team said that they have had struggles this year. They are having a hard time getting out of bed. They are hard, having a hard time doing this work because it's hard. It's emotionally exam, um, exhausting. It's also necessary. And this, this is a trauma on top of another trauma, which is we're living in a pandemic. So many of my research team members have had their housing loss this year. They have had COVID. They have had family members get sick and die. And so I think we all need to remember that we need to help each other work through these hard times together and self-care um, I think is also, I think we need to remind each other to, to do good self-care and to remind ourselves to be gentle with um, one another and with ourselves when we do especially emotionally demanding work like studying violence and act against our own community. I found uh, self-care to come in a um, cup of boba and a fat straw. Unfortunately, I live in uh, Waco, so that doesn't come that often. Um, you know, so I got I gotta rely on my 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 boy Jerry to let me know where the good boba is. Um, those those little circle emojis look like boba to me. That's what happens when you're deprived of boba. Um, I I found the writing of this book to be so exhausting. Uh, it wasn't simply the fact of <laughs> trying to be present exactly along the lines of what Melissa said, Zoom meant you could be present almost all the time. Um, it wasn't simply the, the the fact of trying to be present with two communities at two different parts of the country, <laughs> thinking about two very different kinds of things. It was the fact of making arguments against other anti-racists, uh, people who are committed to the same thing, but you think each other are wrong. And it's important to say that. Um, and knowing the consequences of saying it, right? So, like to question whiteness is to be uh, accused of whiteness. Um, and you're stuck in a series of rhetorical um, spaces where there's minefields everywhere. And so I, I, I you know, I think what I hope is, I, I obviously uh, should, be, should be clear, I hope the book does something, but I'll be happy to never write another book about race for two reasons. It was too exhausting. Um, but the other thing is I've written the book I want to write and there's amazingly way more talented people that I have a different, um, obligation to, which is to enable their writing process, you know, as a, as an older scholar. So, um, you know, so, you know, this point forward would be kind of being parts of conversations like this and playing different kinds of leadership roles, but really wanting to empower other people. I will say, you know, I, I made the kind of half joke about Boba. The thing that's really nourished me through this is friendships uh, that I found in this scholarship and including two people here, Melissa Borja and David Chow, who have been dear, dear uh, friends. And I found them in the writing and the research. Um, and they were the ones that helped me understand things that I didn't understand. They are the ones that pointed to me to sources. They're the ones that helped me commiserate or just, you know, joke with on innumerable <laughs> signal texts and chats, um, right? You know, I live for their little, you know, we have the floating emoji thing here. I love, I, I live for David and Melissa's emojis, right? Um, I mean, I think you all can tell how warm they are uh, and that's just kind of who they are. So uh, friendships, right? And the friendships on of the people in this room, like uh, Dr. George, I just found what, everything you've said to be extremely edifying, like super encouraging, you know, and, you know, like, Bonnie's voice, <laughs> it's just like the ultimate moderator voice, right? It's like, it's like the Holy Spirit moderating. So, um, you know, I met Easton when he was a graduate student at Georgetown. It's edifying to see me, for me to see him, how he's, you know, now taking up significant leadership roles. So just the the, the, the life of friendship um, in academia. Uh, I, the, word, the, word, the thing I like least about academia is sometimes it's, in, it's surrounded by these strange social protocols where you're supposed to pretend you're not a human being. I can't stand that um, because I just feel so ashamed of that that's all I can be. And so one time Melissa and I were in this, um, this thing, I didn't know her at all, uh, but we were in this Zoom conference for like academics. 
And I could tell from the genuineness of how she presented herself. I'm like, there's someone I feel a little safer with, right? And, you know, not surprisingly, I became her friend, which I'm sure she laments with all her being, <laughs> but it was good for me. <laughs> yeah, I see a, a very, uh, thanks for that. And <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. continue. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think, uh, Gioma, would you like to yes. jump in? Yes. Okay. Yes. The other day, my colleague Maria and, and I were having a conversation precisely on this. And she was encouraging me, and we were having this conversation together to th shift from self, you know, to our care, from self care to our care. Because self care is so individualistic. It is very me, I, but you cannot really have a self care until we have our care. As uh, uh, Melissa was sharing, right? Our colleagues in our community that's going through so much trauma, death, unemployment, uh, dislocation, right? Reorientation, you know. And at this time, we need the ecology to thrive. So how do we then shift from self-care to our care? Uh, and it's something that we've been pondering. And it is very crucial, I believe, in order to cultivate the ecology of flourishing together so that it's, it's not just you, but especially Asian Americans, you know, we work hard, right? We work long hours. It's in our DNA, right? But then how do we make sure that all of us are flourishing, all of us are caring for one another? And along that, having wise companions along our journey saying, Jaman, it's time for you to pause. You know, so having friendships and wise companions uh, and creating our care ecology. I, I love that, Giamon. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Very, a lot of wisdom here and so important. So, uh, can I add one uh, quick point too? Um, of course. Uh, I just wanted to put in a word for professional counseling uh, for mm -hmm. our care. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think people use that all the time for self care, but I really like Giamon's point that it's about community care. And sometimes uh, seeing a professional uh, who's not in your community can actually be this powerful voice that can speak into things that maybe nobody in the community currently can see or is equipped to talk about. So I just want to throw that out there. Uh, when doing all this incredible work, uh, the emotionally uh, gravitated kind of work, uh, yeah, maybe some counseling could be helpful there. Amen. Thanks so much for lifting that up, especially in our Asian, Asian American community. This is a good word. The Ju Chan Bach asks, sometimes ethnography is written for other academics and not for the communities. How can churches keep academic institutions accountable? What would you like to see happen from churches and lay people and the communities themselves? What can we do? I'll chime back in here uh, quickly. Um, I know my internet seems to be uh, kind of slow. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, just making sure. I think the academy, whether you are a historian, a sociologist, a theologian, can benefit from more of an action research sensibility where the response of the community you are studying, uh, that those responses are taken very seriously and you reflect back to those communities how you've integrated those responses. Working with churches. Um, and that the whole idea behind action research is that the research should be actionable for the community that you have been studying. That this is not just insightful for others, but it's insightful for them uh, to be able to move into a new season of their growth as a church, perhaps, or as a community organization, as, um, as an activist group. Um, and that, that cycle needs to happen more regularly. I think academics ease, get really easily caught up in the publisher parish mentality as much as we don't want to. It is so easy to be sucked into it. And I think uh, the, the action research sensibility can, uh, can, can keep things closer to the ground. And it's something that I hope that I can, I can live into. In the yes. UK, um, we have um, a lot of 
um, push towards public engagement with our research. And that's definitely built into our assessment system. And by no means perfect, but moving towards that. And so um, the, the funding bodies are trying to make uh, researchers and research um, institutions more accountable to um, the community and the public bodies. So um, I hope to see more of that happening. And I'm, I'm pretty excited with different um, channels of um, public engagement that it's built in even in our, um, our training. And so there's a lot of uh, like being human festival, three minute thesis and all that ways to get the public to know a bit more about our research and so that we're kept accountable to who's being funding the, the research and also so that it's not just for academics but also for just the general public and it's in a it's conversed in a way so that it can be consumed by the general public thank you so much and this conversation has been so illuminating and we can continue in our next session. David, did you want to make any comments? Yeah, so it's two o'clock. I imagine people could use a stretch break and uh, maybe grab, grab a glass of water, get that uh, second cup of coffee for the day. So let's take a 10 minute break. We will, it's um, almost two o'clock East Coast time. We will reconvene in 12 minutes at 2.10 Eastern, 2.10 Eastern. So uh, we will end session. Thank you all for a wonderful panel. Thank you, Bonnie, for leading this panel discussion and we will reconvene in 12 minutes. Thank you all. <laughs>